Here, read this. Woof. So today I thought I'd talk about five books I've read recently, starting with Douglas, which is a verse play written by John Home. Home is one of the writers honoured on the Walter Scott Monument here in Edinburgh. His face is halfway up on the, I think, eastern side. I tried to get a picture to use in this video, but it was it was useless. He's basically just a little head on the wall. Uh, you wouldn't really be able to make much out. But this play was uh, something of a sensation when it was first performed in Edinburgh in 1756. It uh, elicited the response from one of its audience members, Was your Willie Shakespeare new? And for a while, uh, Home was championed as a sort of uh, Scottish Shakespeare. Um, it was famous enough to be referenced in books by people like Jane Austen and Dickens. And it also landed Home in, in some trouble. As well as a writer, he was a minister uh, of the Kirk and he had to resign after the play became a success. It wasn't the done thing for church ministers to be writing plays. A lot of the critical debate of the play uh, pits home against Shakespeare and partly that's to do with the the plot of the play itself so it can it concerns um, Douglas, a ancestor of the Douglas that we find in um, Shakespeare's Henry IV. And in fact, the play has two prologues, which uh, rather interestingly, one is intended for the London audience and one intended for its Edinburgh audience. In the London one, the, uh, the more recent Douglas who uh, assisted um, Percy Hotspur in Shakespeare's play, his former captor, in the time of Henry IV, is referenced, and the prologue ends with a uh, appeal to London audiences to be kind to this Douglas as Percy once was. Uh, by contrast, the Edinburgh introduction is all about Scottish national feeling, reminding its audience that um, their ancestors had, had maybe followed a Douglas into battle in years gone by. The play's Edinburgh performance is also memorialised in this caricature by John Kay. Burns uh, were approved of the play, saying that here Douglas forms wild Shakespeare into plan, uh, once again drawing a comparison between Holmes' play and Shakespeare. Despite the popularity of the play, Dr. Johnson criticised it for not having even 10 good lines. I really enjoyed reading the play, it's the first time I've read it. It isn't an onslaught of memorable quotes or beautiful lines, but it's an effective melodrama that addresses destiny, living in the past, and features a memorably um, artificing villain. To give you a little taste of home style, here is uh, Lady Randolph in full flow in Act 2. Have you not sometimes seen an early flower open its bud and spread its silken leaves to catch sweet airs and odours to bestow? Then by the keen blast nipped pull in its leaves, and though still living die to scent and beauty? Emblem of me, affliction like a storm, hath killed the forward blossom of my heart. Uh, speaking of Burns, the next book I'm going to talk about is this. It's The Wind That Shakes the Barley, with annoyingly uh, reflective cover for this light. It's by James Bark. I mentioned this on my recent podcast on Burns, um, where I talked about his poem, Address to Edinburgh. This is the first of a uh, quintet of novels that Bark wrote about the life of Burns. This takes us up to uh, the death of his father, William Burns, and Burns uh, taking over running the family farm. Uh, this first volume f uh, came out in 1946. I had kind of mixed feelings about this, to be honest. I would recommend it to anyone who's really into Burns. Um, when you are devoting this many pages to just the first part of Burns's life, you are going to get a, a tremendous amount of detail. Um, and there is something to be said for uh, bringing to life less commonly explored aspects of Burns's life. I don't think in any biography I'd read of Burns, I'd got quite as thorough a depiction of his time in Irvine, working as a uh, heckler, so someone who is um, preparing flax before it is spun. There are moments of really nice writing, particularly when Bark is addressing the Scottish landscape. Um, however, I, I found the majority of the writing style to be quite plodding, um, rather plain and inclining to cliche at times. There are a couple of really bizarre moments as well. Twice he uses um, photography language or language of cameras and films to talk about uh, Burns's brain, um, saying at some point that the camera of his memory changed or something like that. And then later on it, he, he, he's recalling some memories and watching the film of his memory play back. I thought that was a really, really bizarre choice to use in a novel about Burns in the 
middle of the 18th century. It also uh, repeatedly did something that I, I really don't like in novels about authors, which is make reference to the famous word works in a kind of Easter egg sort of way. So, um, I mean, the chapter titles are often taken from uh, songs or song titles or lyrics of Burns. That That's fine. I wouldn't mind a scene where you literally describe Burns coming up with one of his songs, as as Bach does. But it's more the, the sort of throwaway wink-wink references, which happen a little too often for my liking. It's, it's sort of, um, yeah, it feels a bit groan-inducing, to be honest. All in all, it's a kind of strange, slightly unwieldy hybrid between biography and fiction. Um, Bach says in his uh, prefatory note, that um, here the reader may care to know how far this fictional life from Burns adheres to historical fact. It does so much more firmly than the biographies. And yet it, it features uh, characters who Bach has made up. I'd almost have preferred to have either read a, a massive five-volume biography or a novel in which Bach kind of let his foot off the brake and allowed himself to invent a little bit more freely. Something about the sort of half and half approach seems to have made it a little bit lumbering at times. Um, so yeah, mixed feelings. I did enjoy reading it, but I think that's because I'm really into Burns. I'd recommend it if you are too. I feel kind of resigned to reading the next four. The third volume is when we get to Edinburgh, so I think I'll at least read till there, as I am slightly biased as the host of Edinburgh's most powerful book podcast. Almost forgot my own tagline there. So that is um, The Wind That Shakes the Barley by James Bark. Next we have this book. I, I've spoken about this one before because I made a quick video when I, I bought this book last week. Uh, it was Moments of Synchronicity, as I said. Um, I just released that podcast on Address to Edinburgh, which features the line, I shelter in thy honoured shade. Burns talking about Edinburgh. And I found a volume of verse dedicated to Burns called Honoured Shade. Um, I think the day after I'd done the podcast, which just felt too good to be true. Anyway, I've since read it. Uh, as I said, it's it's full of um, familiar faces from Scottish poetry. I haven't been able to figure out which um, poets declined. Uh, uh, Norman McCaig, who edited the volume, makes a reference to um, the absence of certain famous names is not necessarily due to editorial choice, implying that some famous poets uh, turned, turned down the opportunity to feature in it. It has poems written in Scottish, English and Gaelic. Most of the poets I, I was kind of familiar with. I was surprised that there weren't more poems that were actually dedicated to Burns or responding to work by Burns. Um, there were two poems that referred to Milton, um, and both of which I really liked. I had read the Edwin Morgan one before, which was uh, What is Paradise Lost Really About? That's a great poem. Um, and then the other one I wasn't familiar with, which was by J.F. Hendry, which was uh, called The Death of Milton. Um, and one of my favourite discoveries was also by J.F. Hendry, which I thought I'd just quickly read you. It was a, a melancholy poem called Parting. Once they were mirrors and loved each other's images, winding on precariously through time. But now, the mirror empty, pantomime postponed, how do they love? What are the stages? Why, they've cheated time. He shall not see that dark hand laid on her, nor she that fight when he betray his eyes into the light. They're spared, and consummate no tragedy. Neither can ever be compelled to view the cruelty of that last antagonist, wrapping the face of love away in a mist, deeper than these dark waters both live through. Each, in assuming the other's agony, has driven the terror of death forever away. Um, so, yep, yeah, there, there's my... Uh, this came out in 1959. It was to celebrate the bicentenary of, uh, of Robert Burns. I've got quite a few of these types of uh, anthologies of Scottish poetry. Um, there's a lot of shared material, but that has to be one of the prettiest ones I've found so far. From poetry then to science fiction, I've just read They Shall Have Stars, which is the first in James Blish's series, Cities in Flight. I think I first read this as a, as a teenager at school, uh, raiding the school library for science fiction, which was pretty much my whole diet of reading at the time. This, uh, the first volume uh, came out in 1956, has a kind of knotty history of how it was an uh, anthologized. I think he wrote the earlier ones later. I forget the details, to be honest. I'm a big fan of James Blish. He is probably best known for writing Star Trek novels and Star Trek stuff. He wrote novelizations of the original series episodes. I'm very fond of those, um, but in the nicest possible way. I, I, think his, I think his enthusiasm for Star Trek was in earnest and everything. I think those are sort of hack work, really. 
um, I think those were paying the bills so he could write stuff like this because this is leagues and leagues ahead of anything he wrote for Star Trek. It's dense, it's idea driven. It offers, the whole series offers a kind of interesting counterpoint to Asimov's Foundation series. It is again concerned with um, scattering certain Western ideas of, about civilization across space. Characters who have a very strategic idea of what the next millennia are going to look like. Unlike Asimov, though, this one begins uh, in our world in the far off future of 2013, um, where a US senator is beginning to sort of put the pieces in place to begin this humanity preserving uh, space master plan. This first volume, uh, They Have the Stars, is concerned with two uh, kind of parallel scientific breakthroughs. One has to do with space flight. Um, the creation of the Spin Dizzy, this uh, anti-gravitational device which allows uh, humankind to travel vast tracts of space at incredible speeds. The other discovery is medical. It's an anti-agathic drug that aims to basically defeat death, thereby allowing the, uh, the passengers in these new space vessels um, enough of a lifespan to actually survive these huge journeys that they're going to make. The Immortality Twist is another way that it offers a kind of interesting counterpoint to Asimov's Foundation series, which, uh, if you're not familiar with that, it also leaps thousands of years into the future, but its characters are human and mortal, so we just abandon them, and uh, part of the fun of the Foundation series is sort of picking up what's happened to humanity in the interim. Blish instead has uh, immortal humans. I mean, this, this first volume doesn't make any of those jumps, but the series as a whole does. So in a way, it, uh, it more resembles the recent Foundation series, which came up with ways to make certain, of it, certain characters immortal. Um, there is the Dynastic Empire, which is one of the best things about the series, but it allows the same three actors to be ruling at various points in history because it's, it's always a cloned emperor that's, uh, that's in power. And they've come up with other things like holograms and uh, people who are uh, put into deep sleep and shot through time. I really like the Foundation series and I think that sort of jumping ahead in time and just discarding the last load of characters is part of the, that series kind of restless exuberance. But this feels much richer, uh, much more uh, stylistically mature. There is a fantastic set piece early on set on a, a bridge on Jupiter. Um, which is uh, really, really memorable. So yeah, I'm going to quickly move on to the um, other three. Uh, and who knows, Blish may feature as the first uh, sci-fi podcast that I've done. Uh, and finally, we have this book, uh, England's Insular Imagining, the uh, Elizabethan Erasure of Scotland. This is by Lorna Hudson. Um, it is out uh, last year from Cambridge University Press, which will mean that it's um, eye-wateringly expensive. I looked out and found it in a second-hand shop and picked it up for a song. Um, but if you are interested in getting a copy, I'd advise you go to your library. This is a series of essays looking at the different ways in which Elizabethan writers tended to conceive of England as uh, an island unto itself. Early on, Hudson looks at the uh, the Ditchley portrait of Elizabeth I. In fact, it's, it's reproduced in here. Um, it's the famous portrait in which she is standing on a map of Britain and um, blocking out Scotland. That really sets the tone for the whole book, even though it's mostly concerned with authors, not um, not visual arts. I found it really, really fascinating. It looks at a range of, of writers I'm really into, obviously Shakespeare, but Spencer too, as well as uh, contemporary accounts of England's repeated invasions of Scotland. Hudson takes pains to point out that England... Um, wasn't, as she is often described, indifferent to Scotland, but actively trying to undermine and uh, harm Scotland through subterfuge, through propaganda, through a whole network of uh, strategies. I found that particularly interesting when I got to the last chapter, the coda that was on Macbeth, and um, started to see the witches almost as representing England's will uh, in uh, interfering with the Scottish royal line, loading the dice against Macbeth and ensuring that he will fail. It was a really eye-opening book. Uh, it showed me how often, even now, when you read references to England's invasions of Scotland, how they are framed as, uh, you know, trouble with the Scots. The Scots were, the Scots were agitating. The borders, once again, needed smoothing. And when you consider the uh, proximity of those smoothing out the borders and uh, the arts, uh, the case for an organized propaganda machine against Scotland becomes really clear. 
So, for example, in the 1570 invasions of Scotland, one of the, the leaders of that invasion was Lord Hunsdon, who later became patron of uh, Shakespeare's company, the Lord Chamberlain's Men. So, yeah, if that sounds of interest to you, it's called England's Insular Imagining by Lorna Hudson. That's it for now. Until next time, happy reading.